Hello, everyone. Welcome to Edwards Mediation Academy's opening webinar. My name is Susan Edwards, and I'm filling in for Kristen as host. Today, Rob Bruce, excuse me, will be uh, talking with Rob Fersh of Convergence, and they'll be discussing using mediation skills to address differences and build consensus around contentious issues. If you have any questions for either Rob or Bruce, please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll do our best to address as many questions as possible, but if there's any we don't get to, we will reply by in writing as quickly as possible. So with that, Bruce. Thank you, Susan. Welcome everybody to Edwards Mediation Academy and our conversation this morning on employing mediation skills to tackle seemingly intractable issues. We are joined today by over 200 people, and I know uh, firsthand that's due to the honored guests that we have the privilege of uh, talking with this morning. We've got this unique opportunity to hear from a coveted guest and a dear friend, Robert Fersh, whose work in convening conversations, promoting understanding, and more often than not, finding agreement between people of differing political and policy points of view is both visionary uh, instructive for all of us in the field and couldn't be more timely. Before I get to a more formal introduction of Rob, our guest, I want to just uh, talk for one minute about the, uh, the serendipity of how we came to be friends. <clears throat> for those of you looking for confirmation that the world works in mysterious ways, uh, this story is about that uh, chance um, connection. And there was a time about 12 years ago where um, I was up in a small mountain town in the Austrian Alps um, for a, a semi-annual uh, or biannual uh, conversation with other like-minded dispute resolution professionals, mediators, neurobiologists, um, trauma therapists, and others. And, uh, part of the program was the opportunity to just duck in different rooms and learn from people uh, doing different things. One small uh, group I walked by, there was a young man in that room. Uh, and the topic was improving relations between Pakistan and the United States. And I was intrigued and I, I walked in the room and I sat in the back and I listened to this young man really uh, describing many of the types of things that we do as mediators to convene conversations only on a much grander scale. And I was, I was completely fascinated and drawn into the discussion. And after his prepared comments were concluded, I went up and introduce myself afterwards. And, and this young man uh, described uh, not only the work that he has been doing in his organization uh, by the name of Convergence had been doing in this area, but also other ambitious projects that they had undertaken. And then he commended me to uh, meet his boss, uh, the brains behind the outfit, a man by the name of Rob Fersh, and, um, uh, which we did. We took him up on that invitation. Uh, we met Rob, uh, and over the last 10 years, have had just the delightful pleasure of being in his presence in small dinners, in intimate conversations, listening to him in large audiences, and really becoming sort of a student of the work that he's done uh, in his um, uh, nonprofit called uh, the Convergence Center for Policy Resolution. And most recently, Susan and I have uh, been able to serve on his advisory committee, uh, where we've had the unique opportunity to continue uh, <clears throat> supporting the work of this remarkable human being and his brainchild, uh, Convergence <clears throat> Center for Policy Resolution. Uh, now to Rob himself and, and a little bit of more of his background. Um, Rob is the founder uh, of Convergence and until more recently the CEO of that organization. Um, which was formed after over three decades of Rob working on the front line of national policy making uh, for different congressional committees. And after a brief uh, stint uh, testing some of his ideas, search for common ground, he saw the need to create a new capacity for people of differing political and policy views to work together to, some, to solve some of the nation's most intractable problems. And so about 11 and a half years ago in 2009, Rob and colleagues started Convergence, and he has there uh, successfully convened stakeholder groups and individuals in problem-solving conversations on issues ranging from healthcare, uh, nutrition and wellness, reimagining education, economic mobility, incarceration, and more. <clears throat> and so for those of us who at times feel that our daily lives uh, are spent uh, thinking about uh, more modest 
uh, intractable issues. These reflect some of the, the, the most uh, compelling issues of our time. And so I'm uh, truly delighted uh, to be able to welcome Rob first to our conversation this morning. Thank you, Rob, for your generous gift of time in sharing with um, Edwards Mediation Academy and many of the loyal followers who are here because of you, some of your thoughts on these important topics. Well, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Susan. Uh, greatly appreciate this opportunity to be with you. And we do, uh, for everyone else, there's a mutual admiration society, I think so highly of what as Bruce and Susan are doing through the Academy, what they do as skilled mediators and the kind of sensibilities they're bringing to the world. So we are very much soulmates about this and it's an honor to work with both of you and I look forward to the conversation this morning and, and to talking with and relating to all the people around the world who are joining us. It's really quite impressive, uh, the people whose lives you've reached all the way around the world. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start this morning with a question of how you found yourself at that moment in time in 2009 with the inspiration to begin Convergence. And I, I was once asked by a reporter in India after I gave a talk, you know, was I drawn to the world of mediation or did it find me? And it, it sort of gave me a sort of pause to think about that question. And in turn, I like to ask others, but did, did the work at Convergence find you or did it, was it a, a inspiration in some other fashion? I think a combination of each, Bruce, to be honest, I think in some ways I'm a mediator at heart. I think I've always been that way. As soon as I tell people I'm the middle child, the sister on either side, they say, of course, that's what you had to be. Um, but I think I've always been inclined that way to try to you know, build peace, even in conflicts on the playground, I'm told, in grade school, I was in the middle of those, trying to solve them. Maybe I'm conflict averse or didn't want to get beaten up, who knows. What the, what the origins were. But really the origins for convergence was that, um, the origins were that I had been involved in public policy, as you mentioned, Bruce, and I moved to Washington out of law school with a passion to do something about the issue of poverty and hunger in the United States. And I mainly joined in uh, progressive efforts to do so. But in the course of that, I I met so many people of great decency who wanted to solve problems and had ideas different than my own. I began to see that no one side has all the answers. So working with in various congressional committees, I always ended up working what we call bipartisan in the United States across parties. Got to know members of Congress from the opposite party and they were decent and kind and compassionate. They just saw the world differently. And ultimately I felt like I couldn't live with the cognitive dissonance of you know, uh, hearing from people who are decent and kind and smart and had different points of view and then just insisting that my own perspective was right. So what I began to see, and this started actually 20 years ago, it took about a decade to incubate convergence, uh, was that there was a capacity missing in Washington uh, and around the country where people who had leadership positions in terms of advocating different points of view or in terms of their role on a particular problem they had no place to really sit down and talk to each other and hear each other and understand each other at a deeper level. And in many cases, they just stereotyped each other and they generalized about each other. and They couldn't go deep in terms of understanding each other and see the legitimacy of what each other had to offer to better solutions. So while it wasn't fully formed in my mind 20 years ago, the notion was that let's bring together all the people who are in a sense stakeholders who all have some knowledge, experience, or influence over an issues, such that if they only talked with each other, they could come up with better answers, and in the process, potentially lower the temperatures in terms of how they fight and debate each other every day. And that came out of my work with Congress, where I obviously saw people fighting for one side or the other, and underneath it all, you began to see that maybe no one side had all the answers, and that we needed some different mechanisms to allow people to work more effectively. And of course, that just ties us, I think, directly to the mediation field where you understand usually in a dispute that no one side has all the right answers or is completely correct. And there are ways to find bridges between people who disagree. And I think that's largely what drew me initially to Afkif and that uh, conversation in a small classroom in uh, Austria it was a, a recognition that what he was speaking about and ultimately what I found to be your life passion Really, uh, you and I are 
uh, different branches of the same uh, family tree and uh, that there are or is overlap in how we approach these problems. Uh, and it's some of that overlap that I want to try and get into today and explore further with our, our audiences to, to sort of promote that understanding. Um, I'll make one observation and, and put it in the form of a question. Obviously, 45 days before a national election, the temptation is to think in terms of this topic today in the context of a political divide. But what you've been doing is so much broader than that. And obviously, you know, transcends any specific conflict or, or a moment in time. Uh, take a moment and talk about some of the issues that Convergence has um, um, worked on over the years to give our audience a, a better feel for the breadth of your uh, efforts. Great, Bruce, thanks for the question. And uh, so let me start that there were a couple of projects even before Convergence was created as an independent organization, as you mentioned, I worked for a wonderful international organization called Search for Common Ground. And it, while I was there, I ended up working on a big domestic issue, which was healthcare coverage. And some of that work actually led to um, the Affordable Care Act in the United States. But one of, maybe of interest to your audience, particularly today, is we did a big project on U.S. Muslim relations. This was um, starting around 2006, uh, maybe 2005 or 2006, during the administration of George W. Bush. And there was a sense at that time, given what had happened after 9-11, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that maybe there needed to be a different approach uh, how to solve our relationships with a larger Muslim world. And so we pulled together some high level diplomats like former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and Ambassador Dennis Ross, former members of Congress from especially the Republican Party, eminent Muslim Americans of all different stripes and backgrounds, uh, 11 of them, about a third of our group were Muslim American. We brought in the former director of the American Israel Political Action Committee, APAC, and others. And we had a conversation which led to consensus recommendations on how the U.S. could improve its engagement with the larger Muslim world to try to head off future acts of terrorism and division and misunderstandings across religion. So that's an origin story. Beyond that, uh, Convergence has worked primarily in the United States. Um, you know, and one outgrowth of that U.S. Muslim engagement project was further work you mentioned before on U.S.-Pakistan relations which culminated in a summit, if you will, between members of the parliament in Pakistan coming to meet with members of Congress here. And it was very effective to try to create better relationships between the two countries. But to give you a taste, the United States, still to this day, as you know, it's a big election issue, has disagreement about how we do healthcare. We've done several rounds of negotiations on healthcare to help build bridges and find common ground on how to provide healthcare in this country. Uh, we have tremendous issues of inequality in wealth in this country and income. And we frame that up as economic mobility. How do we give opportunities to people at the lower end of the income scale through employment to move up the ladder and one of the barriers and we had big business and labor unions and academics and community groups all come together for a series of remarkable recommendations. And we've worked in a variety of other areas in the United States, particularly education where it's a hot, but an issue between teachers unions and school reformers and we've gotten them to a common table. That's probably our signature success. But there's a range of national policy issues where we've been able to find people who are leaders in the field who disagree on policy uh, or, or other approaches beyond policy, even private sector efforts. And we've gotten them not only to the table to come up with great ideas, but we've built relationships of trust that are lasting between them and helps transform how they work together over time. And that's a great overview. I want to circle back to some of those examples in a few minutes, and particularly some of those lessons. You know, I'm fond of telling audiences that the lessons of dispute resolution, the skills of bringing people together and resolving differences are too important in today's world to be viewed as proprietary that we really need to sort of share with each other what we've learned in these moments, like you've just described, for mutual benefit and, and societal gain. Um, what I'd like to do this morning is maybe pull back the curtain a little bit on a sort of step-by-step -step, uh, assessment of how you approach a seemingly intractable problem so we can sort of look at those lessons together. And without necessarily identifying a, a specific example yet, 
let's just walk through kind of procedurally the things that you would think about. So I'm a, I'm a staff member at Convergence and I walk into your, you know, uh, wood paneled office, you know, with a sweeping view of the Capitol Mall. And I say uh, over a cup of coffee, Rob, you know, I've had this great idea overnight about something that uh, I think we need to uh, try and tackle. And it's really near and dear to my heart. And, uh, you know, what do you think? Can we take it on? Where do you start this process? Thanks for that question, Bruce. And anyone coming to my office can get a good view of the alleyway with garbage cans right behind the window, which gives you some sense of the, the humbleness, the humility with which we operate, because there's not a surplus of resources for those of us who are bridge builders. In any event, where you can start actually is, and it's a good example, anybody can have an idea about something to take on. It's come from staff, it's come from board members, it sometimes comes from outside parties who've heard about our work and they come to us. So the first thing we do, we have specific criteria about how we, uh, what issues we'll take on. But first we'll see, is it an issue of consequence? Is it something important to take on uh, where we should put our energies into it? And we'd also look around and make sure we're not duplicating the efforts of anybody else who might be working on it. Uh, do you, uh, Rob, do you have any kind of agenda at this stage going in or is this exclusively a process-based approach? There's really no agenda other than just like everyone else, we have our antenna, antenna up about what are the problems that are the most intractable and most serious. And if it's getting solved otherwise, then we don't try to come in. But Obviously, if you live in the United States, you know there are issues about health care, there are issues about immigration, there's issues about operations of police forces these days, there are equity issues. So our antenna are up for those, climate change and so on. And so most of those I just mentioned, we haven't taken on. Um, but others, sometimes we have our antenna up, but mainly we are, we are, are somewhat an equal opportunity um, group in that anything that kind of meets our guidelines, we will take it on given, given resources and capacity to do so. So help me better and help us better understand the ingredients in what you have described in other lectures and talks as the secret sauce of convergence. Meaning after you have formed this idea and you're looking to take it to the next step and try and put your plan in place, what do you do? Walk us through kind yeah. of a sequence of steps. Yeah, and I'll tr I try to do this somewhat rapidly. We can go deeper as we go through this, a lot of stuff. So the first thing is identify an issue that you really care about and you want to take on. And that'll, it's helpful if someone who's a leader in the field comes to you or someone who is willing to put some resources into it. But, you know, you first identify the issue and you have to frame it up, at least initially in a way you think is appealing to people of different points of view. If you frame it up in a loaded way to begin with, for instance, we're looking at the issue of guns right now at Convergence. If you start with calling it gun control, you lose half the people who you want to have at the table. So you have to find a way to frame it up in a way that everyone agrees on the goal. And I think there's a goal there somewhere that's, that no one really wants to see unnecessary loss of life or limb from guns. And can we come together on how to prevent that without any preconceived notion? After that, it, in the best of all worlds, we'll find a few people who represent different points of view to kind of come in and advise us. And we devise some questions to ask. And then we go out and interview a whole bunch of people. Sometimes it could be 10 or 25 people. Sometimes it's over 100 people in order to understand what are the range of views and where is the energy about who needs to talk to whom about what. And in that process, we not only begin to understand an issue from a 360 point uh, degree point of view, we see a whole, everyone's perspective. We begin to understand where the areas of potential agreement might lie and where the contentious issues are that we need to take on. And for those of you who are mediators and potentially want to do the kind of work we do, that work, the research is also really important for building trust with us, that we are honest brokers. We're asking questions, we're finding out, do you want to solve this problem? What is your perspective? What are the barriers that stand in the way of solving it? What do you think the opportunities are? And we'll often hear how guarded and, and defensive they are about people they disagree with. Of course, we're talking to their opposites who feel the same way. And we, we sense underneath it all, of course, that most people, when they get to know each other, can really work together well. And that's 
And that leads to the next element, which is we begin to assemble a table, normally anywhere from 15 to 35 people who are leaders. Rob, Rob let me interrupt for one second, excuse me, but just focus on that first phase for one minute. Give our yeah. audience just some sense of how much time and people and energy goes into exploring the, and doing the research phase to even identify that first group of potential participants. So thanks for that, Bruce. And let me just say it varies. Um, if we're inventing a project out of whole cloth where we don't have deep expertise, and depending upon whether we can put somebody on it full time, it could, it could go six months to a year to do that research. Sometimes some people come to us where the issue is more narrowly framed and there's already a core of stakeholders and it can be a matter of weeks or a month or two in order to assemble a table and do the interviews. So it depends on how open-ended the, the topic is. Economic mobility has many leverage points and many different ways you could approach it. We also were approached a number of years ago to resolve this issue of long-term care in the, in the United States, which is the non-health related services for elderly and disabled people, what they need and to get by in terms of um, you know, supports and, uh, and you know, everything beyond their health care. And there had, and the, particular issue there was how to finance it. So the issue was somewhat narrowly framed and we already had a pretty good sense of who needed to come to the table, we just needed to build trust. So again, anywhere from a month to six months to a year, depending on the complexity of the issue, whether funding's coming in, whether stakeholders are buying in and whether we're be able to clarify fairly quickly where the key leverage points might be for where a conversation might go. Great, and then take us to the next step. So the next step is then to assemble a table. You never can have a perfect table. In some cases, we've had complete heavy hitters who are, you know, world renowned and they're talking to each other and they're going to have deep influence if they reach agreement. In other cases, it may not be the CEOs of groups or organizations, but high level people who can influence organizations and who are knowledgeable and their ideas may carry weight. So it's very important then to assemble a table in my point of view, from my point of view, as diverse as possible. So long as after some vetting, you have a sense that people will be willing to participate in good faith, that we can put them in a culture where they'll respond to being uh, you know, courteous to other people, and listen to other people, even though they're passionate about their point of view. Important that people come in with at least a little bit of an open mind and very important that people be honest there and rely on be able to look at evidence together They may disagree about what the evidence means, but to talk to each other. So we'll assemble a table and we've already begun that process of trust building. When we interview them, they get to know us, we get to know them. And then all the way through this process, the most important thing is to do things that build trust amongst the people. So they open their hearts and listen to each other. And they are in the parlance of what you know well, uh, is you don't start by arguing, arguing positions. You know, we believe the answer is this, we believe the answer is that. We ask people to speak about their underlying interests, their concerns, their fears. We often ask them to personalize what it means to them. And normally we will try to meet um, for two days at a time. Some people travel in from around the country and have people break bread and sleep on it and, and uh, you can get into this. We have ground rules in the, in the room where people aren't supposed to dominate time, they're supposed to listen to each other. We have great facilitation that allows people to have a dialogue at, a, I think, a very high level. They can fight, they can argue, and sometimes it does get heated. But we create a culture of respect in the room that everybody feels appreciated. And everybody's voice counts, whether you're a former Secretary of State or you're somebody else who's more from a community. It'll, you'll be judged on the quality of what you have to offer uh, and what it offers to the room. And we really try to create sort of a level playing field so all voices get heard. Pause for a moment, Rob. You give a very good description of this process and I just wanna take it even one step further. So you've identified people, you bring them to the table as diverse a group as possible. You set ground rules to some degree, are encouraging respect and listening. You have a facilitator in the room and you set up these I'll call sort of intensive, sounds like almost weekend retreats. How many of these does it take for people to start to shake off some of the shackles of distrust and start to come to respect each other, or at least hear each other's positions, and maybe even get to more sort of productive uh, ground? 
So again, there's, there's kind of on average, but every process is different. And I would also say, as we get to it, like if you work in local communities, people might, might talk more often. Uh, they might meet more often. Right now, we ordinarily meet about four times a year if it's a two-day meeting just because of logistics. But if all the stakeholders are in one community, they might be able to come together once a month or, or, and or also meet in between. So, uh, and trust is built, you just never know how trust is built. I'll tell one quick story, which is a little bit US centric, but first project I ever got involved in as a project director, this is before Convergence was on healthcare coverage. And we assembled really heavyweight groups in the United States, CEOs of major interest groups or near CEOs of insurers and hospitals and consumer advocate groups and pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies and think tanks, including think tanks who were pushing for complete market-based systems and other groups were in there suggesting, you know, uh, single payer systems, you know, what the right might call socialized medicines. We had everybody. And I want to tell you that I felt deep trust was built in that room the very first day, unexpectedly. A lot of tension in the room. But we started with a question, about 25 people in the room. We went around the room and asked people to personally talk about why they were at the table, why they cared about this issue of healthcare coverage. And it turned out a number of the groups I thought were a little more progressive, looking to see that the Chamber of Commerce hadn't gone yet. And a very conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, hadn't gone yet. For those who don't, I'm familiar with it. It's a think tank in Washington. It's one of the leading conservative think tanks, a very much a free market uh, approach think tank. And I noticed the progressive groups looking around the room didn't want to scare off what I, I thought didn't want to scare off the conservative groups. They said, well, you know, we're really concerned that a lot of people in the United States don't have coverage. They really need to have coverage. And at that point, there were 50 million Americans who didn't have coverage. This is 2004. We get two thirds around the room. And the, for some people, the dreaded voice from the Heritage Foundation, who later became a dear friend and the Convergence board member, Stuart Butler, pipes up and says, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I believe in universal health care coverage, which was a shocking statement from the person I thought was going to be not that sympathetic to health care, or at least a lot of people did, uh, and certainly universal. That's the first time anyone sound, said universal health care coverage. That, that seemed to smack almost of socialism. Stuart went on to say, I probably favor more market-based approaches, but I'm actually a Brit. I was born in Britain. Everybody has health care coverage. I think it's a shame people don't have it in the United States. Let's discuss how to do it. So I would say in that moment, a level of trust was built that carried on through the proceedings. Doesn't mean we didn't have to rebuild trust after a lot of arguments and fights throughout uh, the process, but trust can happen very quickly depending upon who says what, when. But ordinarily, you know, these processes run about a year and a half altogether, and it's unusual after two or three meetings if we don't have deep trust in the room, even though disagreements persist. Do you, Rob, have, have an objective, start with an objective? Do you let it evolve organically based on the interests and needs of the participants? Well, we try to have an objective in terms of an overall goal for the organization. Uh, it does shift in the interview process as we put it together, and it can shift in the room if that's where the stakeholders are going. But we bring them under in under some premise so that at least we're not so open-ended and people know what they're getting into. And so, you know, well, for instance, we had a remarkable project on the incarceration in the United States. You may know the United States is the most heavily incarcerated country amongst developed democracies. And there's so many different pieces that you could take on. You could take on, well, who gets arrested to begin with and for what crimes and how long are the sentences? And, and, uh, and you could take on what happens in prison. You can take on what happens when they're leaving prison and so on. And although a lot of people were focusing on other issues, including length of sentencing and how people got arrested to begin with, we saw a niche that very few people were looking at the issue of what happens in prison to help people come out so they can be successful. And in the initial stage of when they go back to the community, nobody had really tried to go into that. What happens in prisons is a, often a sort of a black box. People don't really un understand it. And we found we had a niche where we could really make a difference on that particular issue. And we assembled a table to reflect that rather than some other pieces of that. 
So you, it, you, you have to decide what's important enough and big enough to assemble people and will make a big difference. But you can't boil the ocean every time. You can't deal with every aspect of complicated social problems uh, in just one project. But you, you lift up something you think is manageable and worth doing. And you hope it sets the stage for future additional work uh, where your own work may be incomplete. As Steve Jobs describes it, trying to make a dent in the universe. Yeah. Um, you, you've talked well uh, and, and uh, sort of in detail about the process itself, you, and you've anticipated, I think, a little bit of my next question. Can you talk about briefly a success story? Uh, you mentioned earlier that, that you may uh, have, have uh, thought about the um, education, re reimagining education is one of your many successes. Do you want to just fill in some color uh, on that experience in terms of who yeah. you brought together and what you were able to accomplish? Yeah, thanks for that, Bruce. And, and I think just to complete on process, the whole idea of the process is to create dialogue that leads to people coming together on ideas. And then as much as possible, committing to working together over time to implement those ideas, whether it's through legislation or private sector initiatives or changes in public understanding or changes in philanthropic priorities. There's a whole different leverage points that can do so. But I think one of the projects we're most proud of uh, it was on K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade education in the United States when we started it, which is now almost 10 years ago or about 10 years ago under the leadership of Kelly Young, who's done a remarkable job. The country was, and it remains divided, deeply divided about how we do K through 12 education. And everybody had a different answer. Um, some people wanted to reform the schools within the current system and they blamed teachers unions as if they had too much power and were holding up change and they were into their selfish interests. We had teachers unions who felt that the system, which increasingly turned to testing and, and really circumscribed what teachers could do in the room and had them running around trying to prepare kids to do tests, um, they were unhappy. We had people who felt that if you only could computerize every classroom, we'd be able to transform education, and that seemed to be, you know, a good partial answer. We had people who were worried about the social and emotional learning that occurs in the classroom and the failure to address the individual needs of kids. I mean, everybody had their own answers to why the U.S. education system was in many ways failing to achieve its promise in terms of getting people across the board on an, equ and on an equity basis ready to succeed in life. And what emerged, and this is part of Kelly's leadership, but wonderful stakeholders, is that we needed to reimagine education in the United States. The model had been very much built, really the 19th century, kind of a factory model that almost all kids of the same age would learn the same thing at the same time at the same place. And the world had changed as the phones in people's hands gave them knowledge and information. And we began to understand that there is no such thing as an average kid. Every kid learns differently and so on. The upshot is that after a very, very tense beginning, and I can tell you that of all our projects, um, I thought after the first day, there might not even be a second day, but we were able to pull it together. These disparate groups, the unions and the charter school networks, and we had Disney and we had Lego, and we had a New York City public school principal and a charter school principal from Houston, and all sorts of other great thinkers and activists um, on education came together to form a transcendent vision of what could happen to transform K through 12 education in the United States in the long term. And not only did they get so excited about these ideas, they did not want to depart each other. Uh, they wanted to stay at the table and talk to each other and build these ideas out. And so two years ago, we spun off an independent organization that Kelly now heads with the support of all these groups. We had foundations at the table, luckily, and they really wanted to put money into this. And now they're trying to take these ideas out into the world, not tap down legislating from Washington, but building up through networks around the country, excitement about how do we focus on learner-centered education? How do we bring education to meet the needs of every child, even though every child's needs is different? And they have made remarkable progress in formulating that vision and creating all sorts of areas and supporting all sorts of areas that want to move that idea forward. So they're now soon to enter their third year of independently 
moving the, these ideas forward, but keeping this strange bedfellow coalition together, which I think is unprecedented in terms of uh, the reach of any organization working on uh, education ref, um, transformation in this country. What a remarkable story. I'm sitting here thinking, for most of us mere mortals, if one could view that as a singular success in one's uh, life, uh, that might be a true measure. Uh, contemplating that's just one of the many irons in the fire you have going simultaneously is somewhat daunting. Um, let's pause for just a minute. I promised uh, this audience that uh, we would be interactive uh, along the way. Susan, have any questions come in that uh, we could take a break and maybe try and address uh, uh, of interest to the audience? We don't, no questions have come in on the Q&A, but a few were emailed over the last couple of days. So why don't I start with those? Give us one. Um, the first one, is it possible to use this process to help align goals within an organization? I'm a senior manager at a large tech firm in Silicon Valley, and sometimes it seems as though our teams are working against each other. <laughs> Rob, are these skills transferable in that kind of environment? Yeah, I, I definitely think they are. It's not my personal experience, but I have colleagues who've done so. It's really part of a, a larger picture of what I call collaborative problem solving. And uh, I think about my dear colleague, Tom Dunn, who's been writing a book about this, and he finds applications in all different places. So the larger principle here is to take a point of view that says, okay, we've got some issues. We probably have underneath it all have shared goals about how we want our organization to thrive and we may disagree on how to do so. So if you are a leader who can internalize this mindset, and even though you still may be the leader and decision maker, if you're a stakeholder, if you're at the table and you're working to build consensus or near consensus, then you're protected. You know, it's not gonna be some majority vote to overrule you. And if you begin to think about, well, what are the issues that need to be resolved? And what are the voices I really need to hear or we really need to hear? And if we take a mindset that probably everybody has at least something positive to contribute, maybe not all equally, mm -hmm. let's put them in a process where we really go deep and understand their underlying thoughts and fears and concerns, and maybe you do some research in advance to understand that. And then you can convene people to have a much richer, deeper, more respectful conversation that often occurs in the rush of daily events and organizations. So we've done that internally at Convergence from time to time. And there, I'm a stakeholder. I've got my points of view. I'm as fierce as anybody. And then luckily we bring in outside people to facilitate. But I think it's applicable here. Uh, Akif Ahmad, who you mentioned at the beginning, the younger gentleman who introduced you to our work in Pakistan, he's taken this to facilitate a faculty retreat of a grad school here in Washington. Where they all wanted to have a successful grad school, but they were all working in silos and we're working as a team and, and Akif simply took our principles and facilitated a retreat for them. So I do think these ideas are broadly applicable. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another, Susan, I'm sorry, one more question and then yeah. I've got another question for Rob. Another question, a question just came in um, and I think it's probably for the both of you. It's from Sandra. In attempting to get folks to resolve a very contentious case, what do you do to, what do you do to obtain that common ground between the parties and the admin and the mediator, between the parties and the attorneys. I'm sorry. Uh, what do you do between the parties and the attorneys, or between the parties and the attorneys and us? It says, what do you do to obtain that common ground between the parties and the attorneys? Sounds like one for you, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for punning that. <clears throat> the um, I mean, I, I'm listening to Rob's conversation and uh, answers to conversation, and I'm uh, um, focused on some of the sort of common traits or skills that run as threads through this dialogue. And so in the mediation room, uh, in a much more sort of microcosm effort, what we're trying to do is similar things that Rob's describing. You know, we're trying to move away from the polarizing issues themselves help people see each other as individuals with as much common thread as possible regarding their shared values and interests, uh, obviously trying to identify those obstacles to us being able to move forward, uh, whenever possible, trying to build a dialogue between them directly and, and sort of reestablish communication, particularly if that's on a go forward basis, something that will be essential to their future uh, um, uh, efforts. And, you know, ultimately, 
uh, just sort of taking it slowly, uh, recognizing that this is a process that uh, takes time to restore relationships, to rebuild trust or establish it in the first instance, and then build on that in a more substantive way. But that's what happens in the four corners of the room that I'm in most days and uh, in a much more sort of condensed fashion with the, the clock ticking and people having expectations about outcomes along the way. Yeah. The only thing I, uh, Susan, I would just simply say just to reinforce this for people, and I know we maybe we'll talk about how people can apply this in their own communities. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what I find. I mean, we've had people who come to our tables because uh, they're afraid they're going to miss out. They're not that bought into our process, but they're worried if they're not there, they can't protect their interests, or they're worried about where it might go without them, or they're skeptical. But you really can create a culture that brings out the best in most people. Occasionally, you have somebody you can't, you really can't reach and they can't participate. But if you build that culture, people are relieved to be in a place where they can be heard, they feel everyone's fair minded. They're being, they're being listened to, which is, I know what you do as a mediator, Bruce. And, and that begins, I, you know, even with attorneys, I assume that's the case as well, that people begin to see they're part of a process. And eventually they may even see there may, there may be win-win solutions that can come out at the end. It's not only about a zero-sum game. I think that's a big part of what has to happen. I'll comment. I, last night I was reading a couple chapters in a book. It's a pretty heavy book. It's called Behave. The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst by Robert Sapolsky. And the, the chapter I was reading uh, really talked about from a psychological and neurobiological perspective, how hardwired we are to sort of default into an us versus them mentality and looking at each other as sort of opposites, either in group or out group. And I found it fascinating because it speaks to the importance of what we're trying to do to overcome much of that sort of programming in those normal human tendencies. Talk for a minute, Rob, about the skills you're looking for in people within your organization, the, the talent that they bring to the convergence process uh, that helps accomplish the things that you've so well described this morning. Well, thanks, sir. We just acknowledge my many colleagues past and present at Convergence. Believe me, it's a trial by fire to assemble a room where you know the disagreements run strong and many people's livelihoods depend upon it. And to sit yourself in the middle of that as you do every day as a mediator and to understand you're gonna be in the middle of the conflict and at some point as a peacemaker, you may have everybody hating you. So I can't express enough the admiration I have for them. And again, we ordinarily, not always, we ordinarily bring in an outside facilitator who helps run the meetings, but also helps plan the meetings. We work very closely with a wonderful organization called the Consensus Building Institute out of Cambridge, Mass, and they've got brilliant facilitators. But whether it's an outside facilitator or a staff member, you know, what we're looking for is someone who can understand the issues quickly because they have to have the respect of people in the room. Some cases, those issues are pretty straightforward. In some cases, like healthcare, they're infinitely complex. So you have to, you may need a subject matter expert to really go toe to toe. But above all, um, once you get past that, which may have more to do with IQ, you have to go to EQ, uh, emotional intelligence. You need people who, no matter what their personal views are, they have an ability to see the, the beauty and the intelligence of people at different points of view to build trust with them, that they will be listened to, that they will be respected, and that there, there will be no preferences in the room, that everybody has an equal choice. And that takes constant cultivation. Those things happen in rooms or in private conversations. Everybody gets insulted here or there, or upset with people. And we need to have people, uh, people on our staff who, again, understand the issues deeply, but have a sense of how to work with people of all different stripes and to embrace them one way or another. They don't have to agree. But if anyone feels that we're leaning toward one particular point of view or another, um, then we're dead. We can't, we can't commit. There are times when there could be a stakeholder who is an outlier or just is not being productive to the process. And, and it's difficult. You may have to rein that person in or disinvite them from the table. But above all, you need people, you know, both of those intelligences to help move our agenda forward. And if you're fair-minded, if you're open, if you're willing to listen, 
uh, and if you're willing to relate to people in all different walks of life, then that's, that's hugely important to the, to the success of our process. And your answer suggests a question that I often get from people in mediation training, which is, gee, Bruce, uh, what, a, what do you do with that irascible personality? It, you know, there are just some people I can't connect with. I mean, do you find in your work that there are those extremes? If so, what, you know, why and what's the answer? Or, and do you have an example in your own practice of somebody you thought may have been that person and, and you were still able to overcome those differences? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I, thought you, um, I thought you were referring to me as the irascible person. <laughs> uh, so actually, I've had sort of two examples, both ways. Um, in one case, we had a person we were interviewing, and it wasn't that she was so irascible, but it was marginal. We thought maybe she was so opinionated, uh, she's very strong in her points of view, that we weren't sure she could be a productive participant. But on the margins, we decided to invite her in. And of course, if someone like that gets, if you will, um, changes her point of view in the middle of that process, it's like having a convert and it's even stronger than ever. And in that case, it became so beautiful. This person really eventually who came in very critical of the work of some other stakeholders ended up forming a tremendous bond with a leader from the groups that she had most criticized before. And by the end of it, they were hugging each other and, and professing their deep affection for each other and even went on speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. The other side is true also, you just have to watch out. We had someone who had been deeply helpful to us to think about bringing diverse voices to the table, we thought would be utterly constructive. And once in the room, that person just did not seem to be able to conform to basic rules of being somewhat courteous and listening to people and respectful of our process. And we had to carefully suggest that maybe that person should stay connected to us, but not sit in the room every time because the, the presence was a bit toxic. But like, like, you know, great leaders, I think in politics or others, it feels like Martin Luther King, I always look up to it. And he didn't demonize people who disagree with him or, or even did things that were at odds with their goals. And we at Convergence try to maintain relationships with everybody because even if they're irascible, it doesn't mean they don't have good things to say. They just may not be good at part of the process. So we don't throw them out and ask them to leave forever. We still want to look for the value they can bring. But there are relatively few people who cannot acculturate themselves to the process. But I can tell you that there are a lot of people who came in assuming they couldn't possibly talk to other people. A, a person very critical of private prisons, meeting with people who run private prisons, again, for-profit prisons in the, in the United States, and uh, totally unpredictable bonds of respect were formed, and the dialogue was so much better for it. That's a great answer. Um, the thought just occurred to me, we're all in this, um, new environment of COVID-19 forced to rely on things like Zoom platforms, remote learning, uh, distance connection. Uh, how has that impacted convergence? Have you been able to continue uh, programs? Can you envision some of these wonderful uh, steps that you described process-wise taking place uh, virtually? Yeah, th th thanks Bruce. And yeah, and I, you know, I'm not as close to it since I stepped down as CEO on April 1, but what I've learned is that we are proceeding quite well. In fact, we've got a wonderful group of folks uh, who put together sort of best practices on how to do this. And there are limitations. There's some actually gains and some losses from it. On the one hand, sometimes when you're all on the screen, you know, you can't hide and you can see everybody close up and, um, and you can really relate to them and, 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 and talk with them and you can get the voices out. Uh, but given that, so much of our work is about trust and spending time and having meals together or sleeping on or having a drink after the session. There's, I think the relationship building has to go slower and we can't keep them for as long conversations as we'd like. But my sense is that we're adapting and that at least some of the conversations I, even I've been part of since I left, uh, that we're, achieve, we're able to achieve a lot in terms of bu building trust and getting people to talk to each other. And we're yet to really fully test the model just a few months into it. 
how far and how fast can we go? But I'm optimistic, and I hear from other colleagues, they're optimistic that we'll be able to be successful in a Zoom world, uh, even, if, um, even if it might be preferable still to meet in person. Now, the other advantage also is since we bring in people from all over the place, people can make time a little more often and we doesn't have the same expense and we may be able to bring them together for shorter periods, but more often than all the logistical planning of having people come in from around the country, find hotel rooms and meeting spaces and caterers and that sort of thing. So it's a plus and a minus. A lesson I think we can all probably find in our own lives and work these days. Um, Susan, I see other questions coming in. I, I, do you want to uh, yes. interject at this point, take advantage of Rob's uh, wisdom and time? Thank you, thank you. Yes, we have questions from all over. Um, first one from Rachel. How do you encourage the eminent person to participate or persons to participate? Well, um, some it's just a matter of connection, right? And, and um, so and I go back to the US Muslim Engagement Project. We were very fortunate in the early days of Convergence that um, Ambassador Dennis Ross, who many people may know, was the was the lead person in, for uh, Israel-Palestine uh, negotiations for George H.W. Bush and, uh, and Bill Clinton and later worked in the Obama administration. He helped guide the development of convergence. So when we went to him on this idea of how do we cure U.S. Muslim relations, he said, well, let me call Madeline. And by that we knew it was Madeline Albright. And she, when she said, well, if Dennis thinks it's a good idea, I'm going to come in. She said, why don't you call Vin Weber? Vin Weber is an eminent former Republican member of Congress. So in many cases, it's, it's person to person. Once in a while, we can approach people to really just out of the blue as, we, as our reputation has grown uh, to get them to buy in. But they still have to look at us and make sure they have confidence in our track record. So... It's also a mixed blessing. Some intimate people can't really give you the full day and a half or two days at a time. Uh, so you can't always get them. But it is, I think, more a matter of personal relationships and the power of the work. And once you start with somebody eminent who buys in, then it's easier for other people to come in at the same level. Okay. Susan, we may have time um, for another one or two. Well, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, Varsha from India, when you enroll stakeholders, how do you ensure they are representative of the population they claim to represent, especially given that you work on issues of national interest? And how do you ensure that they end up representing the actual interests of the population rather than serving their organizational or ideological interests? It's a great question. And I, I need to acknowledge there's no perfect answer. What I will say is that in the process of doing interviews in advance, again, sometimes 50 or 100 interviews, we'll be probing that. Who is a fair representation of the population uh, that they, they claim to represent? Who, do, who, do, to who, does, who is it that everyone respects? Um, some cases, we'll get multiple representation of an important constituency just to make sure that we're not going to just one voice. And then, Yes, I mean, an organization could be there for their own benefit, but on the other hand, the harder thing is if they're forming, if a consensus is forming in the room is, how do they take it back and convince the people who haven't been through this transformation of the room that they're, it's really a good idea? So what we find, to be honest, is that when we're in that room, we're having those conversations and brilliant minds from all different perspectives push each other's thinking. We tend to end up with ideas that are really in, a lar in the larger public interest. And that ideas that are sort of self-serving to any one community are not really what makes the final, you know, fix that we come up with. So, yes, we're aware of there could be jealousies and we need to do our research. We'll, again, we'll never have a perfect table. We'll try to watch out for that. If we need to make sure we balance it out because there is jealousy between two groups and we can include them both and we have room to do so, we'll try to do so. But it's just a matter of research and trust and instinct and not let don't let the best be the enemy of the good. And I'm sure with that question, if there's a follow-up, I can connect that person to my colleagues at, at Convergence who may be able to answer more thoroughly and better than I just did. And we would certainly encourage people to contact you directly, both in terms of supporting your organization and asking for questions. Yes. Rob, in the short time we have left, and one of the things that I want to just make sure 
we make clear to our audience is uh, one can sit and listen to the, the incredible and ambitious projects that you've undertaken that sort of transcend uh, certainly borders within this country, you know, almost like Moses sort of leading people into the desert, uh, you know, in scope. But yet somebody might be listening to this and saying, I'm just a humble community organizer in a small community with local issues to tackle. Uh, what do you say to those people? Are there lessons that are transferable, you know, within the smaller confines of, of one's local environment that uh, they should take away from this morning's conversation? Thanks, Bruce. I totally believe that's true. It's similar to the question about what about in my organization. I had the honor of going to Sierra Leone, for instance, in I think 2004 for Search for Common Ground. And there I was surprised that there was like a community council operating almost like we did in a local community there where it was right after a terrible time of atrocities there where they, they put together a circle where people met. I remember I actually visited the site and sat outside and they talked to each other. I do think communities, states, localities, provinces, provinces, regions, regions, whatever, um, can identify a problem they want to solve and then think collaboratively. Who are the people who, if only they could talk to each other, might yield wiser solutions and also build a social capital of trust and understanding? And I think they can take the basic steps I've lined out, uh, laid out with your help and apply to that situation. Every situation will be different, but it's really about what I call the collaborative mindset. It's about thinking about this in terms of how do I, not just how do I win with my own ideas, but how do I win and allow others to win by also participating and let me think about whose voice needs to be heard. And here you also need to be careful to think about who is it if I'm inclined not to include them because I don't like them, might be a spoiler. And isn't it better to try to bring them in and talk to them as much as you can, unless they're too irascible and too difficult or too power hungry or too dishonest, you may have to exclude them and your process may or may not be successful. But I believe that this, these ideas are being applied elsewhere. In the United States, there's something called the collective impact movement. And many of the things we do are happening in communities around the country. And I wanna give a shout out to the people who've been forwarding that idea. But I, I do believe this is applicable in so many settings, even in countries that aren't democracies, if people are willing to pull people together just the way, you know, companies and organizations aren't necessarily democracies. You can set up a collaborative decision-making process that includes these voices and allows people to feel they're part of the answer and they then get invested in what they together create. Listening to you brings to mind uh, just a dramatic life moment Susan and I experienced together uh, in one of our trips to Rwanda, uh, training mediators and, and uh, uh, meeting with others. Um, we went to a small village uh, at one instance to celebrate the opening of a community mediation center, the actual physical building, but also to help respect the process that this community had developed. And as testimonials to the power of that collaborative process they had begun uh, in front of the group after sort of the ceremonial singing and dancing that brought the community together of a few hundred people, we witnessed shoulder to shoulder uh, um, someone who was um, convicted in a post-genocide tribunal of having murdered uh, members of the community. And there standing next to him was a family member of his victims. And they had found reconciliation through dialogue and uh, camaraderie in this community mediation center and spoke of that connection uh, that came about from some of the various uh, and same lessons that you've spoken of this past hour. So um, it can happen at a human level. It, it sort of needs to happen at a human level, I think, uh, uh, before we even uh, talk about it in a grander scheme. This is such a moving story, and I would simply say for the people on the call, particularly who live in the United States now, it's, it's my hope that that kind of reconciliation will start now and continue at, at a time when this country is deeply divided across particularly the presidential race, but elsewhere. To remember underneath it all, most of the people in this country, no matter who they're rooting for, are fundamental decency. And we want to maintain relationships and there'll be room to reconcile, even if we disagree strongly about policies and candidates. But the more outrageous behavior by people on either side isn't necessarily representative of who people are underneath and all the people with rooting interests. And it's my hope that 
here and elsewhere in the world, and we know there's a lot of problems in other countries, people will remember that the vast majority of people really want to live in a culture of kindness and, and mutual respect and affection. And we need to set up the systems and approaches and have the kind of leadership that brings that out, out, that out without being Pollyannish. There's a lot of conflict in the world, but if people like you describe can reconcile, then the people now with political differences here can reconcile as well. Amen. Um, we need to bring this to a conclusion as much as I would just love to continue the conversation. And Rob, I've got a little tradition here where I uh, conclude interviews with people. Uh, fortunately for you, the tradition of carpool karaoke has already been taken uh, <laughs> by others. So I'm not, I'm not looking for song, um, but it's what I call the legacy question. And I know there will come a day, not soon, hopefully, uh, uh, when you uh, sort of sit with your grandson, grandchild on your lap and you think back on your career. And what, what do you hope people will remember most about your contributions and think about when they think about Rob Fersh? Well, well, I hope they don't spend too much time thinking about Rob Fersh. Um, <laughs> but what I would love above all is in addition to the fact that we've made a difference in, in the organization on a whole bunch of issues that affect the lives of millions of people in, in the United States, that we are part of a larger groundswell of people's mindsets changing toward collaboration, toward seeing that there's decency um, in so many ways. In fact, one of the um, priorities of my wonderful successor, David Eisner, is to help build community amongst all the groups who have this mindset that we can talk across differences. We do not have to be as polarized. We don't understand each other. And so um, I used to call it building a groundswell so that our success is just, and through webinars like this, Bruce, and through your own remarkable work, you and Susan throughout the world, have people see where they're unnecessarily divided that they can come together. They do not have to be at loggerheads the way they think they are. They sort of pierce the veil of how they see each other. Again, not, not smoothing over unduly, not being dishonest about it, but to look to bring out the best in people and give people the benefit of the doubt. If there's a contribution toward that becoming more of a default setting rather than, as you stated, you know, people think that, it, you know, there's a, maybe there's a, before you said, maybe there's a default setting that we, look at each other as enemies or as competitors. I think it's just as likely we could start with a default setting of, let's assume there's goodwill on the other side and let's figure out how to build on that. And we can always fight later if we need to. Thank you, Rob. A heartfelt thank you uh, for your generous gift of time. I think for those of you who are hungry for more or want to get involved, we can provide you the contact information for Convergence. There's always room for support. There's always room for ideas. I think Rob and I and Susan can all agree that there's no time uh, we're more in need of collaborative effort uh, on a variety of issues. And the importance of hard work and commitment to these causes speaks for itself. I'll leave everybody with one of my favorite quotes from the early 19th century poet Wallace Stevens uh, when he said, long after the final no, there lies a yes. And on that, yes, the future world depends. Here's uh, hoping everybody stays uh, active in pursuit of that yes. But thank you, Rob, again, for all of your time. And I look forward to maybe having another session with you at some point in the future. Bruce, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce and Susan. I know we're over. I really appreciate it. I hope by now maybe my, uh, Jen Fry has put up our, my email and our convergence website. We'd love to hear from people. We'd love to get and hear what you're up to and if we can be helpful in any way. It'd be our honor to do so. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you and thank you everybody. Uh, the recording of this will be available on our website and on the Convergence site. And I know we did not get to all the questions that came in over the last 15 minutes. I apologize. But we will, um, I'll provide them to both Bruce and Rob and they'll put together some responses and we will send out one big email to everybody and include Rob's um, contact info. So thank you very much. And we look forward to our next webinar. <laughs>